Good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to be with you today and to have the chance to introduce our next speaker in the Empire Lecture Series, uh, Anna uh, Gzimala Bose. My name is Christina Bode. I am an assistant professor of political science at Michigan State University. I study international political economy, but early in my career I studied post-communist countries and I've read um, Anna's early work on uh, continuous political parties and the transformation of the state in um, Central and Eastern Europe. Let me introduce um, our speaker in greater detail. Anna Zimala Buse is a professor in the Department of Political Science and the director of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia and the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies at the University of Michigan. Her research interests include political parties, state development and transformation, informal political institutions, religion and politics, and post communist politics. Today, uh, she will explore a different theme. <laughs> She'll explore how religion influences public policy. Why do churches pick some stances and not others? Why do we see variation in their levels of influence, even in countries that are very similar in levels of religious belief and participation, or in denominational affiliations? And finally, why do churches succeed when considerable majorities oppose religious influence on votes, governments, and policy. She argues that the roots of church influence lie in the historical defense of nations by churches. Please join me in welcoming Anna Kstimala Busse. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, so I'll be presenting a project today, um, as indicated, entitled Nations Under God, How Churches Influence Policy. And when looking at the area of religion and politics, and specifically churches as political organizations, there are three puzzles that immediately come up. The first of these is that we see a lot of variation in the levels of church influence on politics, even across countries that are very similar in their religious profiles, whether we measure that by denomination, affiliation, or levels of religious participation. Um, and so this, you know, even though you have countries that are very similar in their religious profiles, churches vary quite a bit in the degree to which they influence politics in those countries. Secondly, we see this influence and this variation in influence, despite, as I'll show you, a pretty widespread opposition to church influence on politics. So it's hard, you know, churches achieve this in democratic settings, despite the fact that the vast majority of democratic electorates object to it. And so that brings up the third question. How do churches manage to do this? Given this popular opposition, and given that religiosity itself doesn't seem to be enough, how do churches influence public policy? Oops, that usually doesn't look quite so uh, chartreuse and brown, but trust me here. Um, so these are the five domains that I examine. Um, abortion, divorce, religion in schools, stem cell research, and same-sex marriage. And what we have here are three pairs of countries that were chosen on the basis of the religious similarity. Um, that's Ireland and Italy, Poland and Croatia, and the United States and Canada. And as you can see, within those pairs, there's quite a bit of variation in the extent to which churches influence politics. Um, I can see, I realize that it's a bit hard to see, but basically the darker and redder the column, the more influence churches have. Um, let's see. And what's, what makes this even more puzzling is the fact that these countries are very similar, right? So Ireland and Italy are both uh, developed democracies. They're countries that are also Catholic monopolies. Um, Poland and Croatia are also now democracies, but both basically went through four decades of communist rule and are also Catholic monopolies. And the United States and Canada, obviously, are a much more ethnically and religiously diverse set of, or pair rather, of developed democracies. So, of course, you know, my fellow social scientists and I um, are a rather creative lot, and so they immediately came up with two different sets of explanations for these patterns. And the first of these basically focuses on electoral demand, right? Um, the second focuses on partisan coalitions. And both of these view political parties as the chief conduit through which this influence occurs, one way or the other. So first, let's examine electoral demand. In this explanation, um, the idea is basically that religious voters push for religious influence. They push for some, you know, having their policy preference, uh, preferences which are concordant with church preferences enacted. But the question is, does this kind of demand exist? So the thing, this is a graph that basically on the horizontal axis um, measures religiosity by participation, which in Christian countries at least is the most demanding measure of um, religiosity. And on the vertical axis, 
um, measures the percentage of respondents that reject church influence on politics. And there are th two things to note about this graph. One of the, the first is that across levels of religiosity, basically the electorates reject, um, reject uh, religious influence on politics. And they do so sort of you know, irrespective of those levels of religiosity. So whether you know, the countries are very religious or not has very little relationship to this rejection. The second thing to note is the intercept, right? The, basically this is, starts at 50%. The baseline starts at 50%, so everywhere in all of these countries, um, you basically have large majorities or small to large, extremely large majorities rejecting church influence on politics. And in fact, in some of the most religious countries where churches have had the greatest influence on politics, like Malta, Poland, Philippines, and so on, you see the greatest levels of this rejection. But the point is that nowhere do we see um, any sort of acceptance of church influence on politics. This is rejected by all of these um, democratic electorates. So the, if popular demand can't do it, can coalitions? And this is basically the dominant account of church influence on politics in uh, social science. This basically argues that since churches themselves can't elect candidates and can't field candidates, they'll form coalitions with sort of, you know, political parties that are viable coalition partners. And what they basically offer is an exchange. The, the parties will offer policy concessions, and the churches, for their part, will basically offer mobilization on behalf of those parties during the elections. So the idea is that churches you know, get out the voters and then get policy concessions afterwards. The archetype of this is the Christian democracy in Italy. Um, basically, you know, there we have the Christian democracy after World War II forming a coalition with the Italian Catholic Church that lasts until the downfall of Christian democracy in 1994. But as we'll see, these kinds of coalitions are both risky and costly. They're risky because no church can be sure that the party that they're ally allied with will actually win the next election, right? So they may be expending a lot of effort for naught. They're costly, because given this widespread popular opposition to church influence on politics, um, churches are basically openly acting in a political way, in ways that you know, will undermine their reputation and their authority. So in sum, there's no evidence of popular demand for church influence on politics. Um, coalitions seem both risky and costly. So the puzzle remains, how then do churches influence politics, given, this, given the, that you know, the sort of two most obvious channels don't quite work? So not surprisingly, given how ineffective these other channels might be, churches prefer other means. Specifically, what they really want is direct institutional access to policymaking. They want to bypass those pesky electorates and political parties, which can be such difficult partner, partners. They want to be able to influence politics basically um, straight on. And it turns out that some of these churches can do this. Some of these churches can gain direct institutional access to policymaking and to the structures of the state. But only some churches can do this, I argue. And those are the churches that have a high moral authority that's rooted in religious nationalism. So put very simplistically, this is, you know, this is about as simple as it gets. Um, this is what the causal chain looks like. That religious nationalism lends churches moral authority which then translates into different kinds of, or different channels rather, of policy influence. So let me unpack this causal chain for you and walk you through it and tell you what I mean by each of these. So first, there's religious nationalism. And what I mean here by religious nationalism is a fusion of religious and national identities, where basically it becomes impossible to conceive of being, for example, Polish without being Catholic or being Irish without being Catholic. This stems largely from a historical defense of the nation by the churches, right? And so these are sort of, you know, this, the kind of stories that are told um, of Catholic churches, basically, usually Catholic churches, protecting uh, the identity, culture, and history of a given nation against an often hostile um, alien power or, um, or other sort of you know, political force. And what's critical here is that religion is necessary but not sufficient for this, right? If there's no point in fusing, you, you can't fuse a religious and national identity if only a small percentage of the nation um, is actually religious. But it's certainly not sufficient. The second thing to emphasize here is that these are often historical myths. It's not the case, for example, that the Polish or the Irish church, uh, churches sort of unequivocally, unequivocally defended and fought on behalf of their respective nations. In fact, they cut all kinds of side deals, they made all kinds of compromises, um, but nonetheless, these historical myths persist and are reified oftentimes, as we will see, through church education. So what are some examples of this? So in Ireland, what we have is the Catholic Church assuming the role of a protector of the Irish national identity for most of the 20th century. Um, that's based basically in its role like, before Ireland became a free state. 
in defending sort of the Irish nation against the British colonial power. And these are stories here of, you know, hedge priests, for example, who would basically teach children um, when the British made Irish education illegal in hedgerows and in fields. Um, and the result here is a presumption of a Catholic Ireland, right? Over time, basically, these two identities become fused closer and closer. Similarly, in Poland, there's a story, sort of a myth, rather, um, of the Polish church as acting first as an anti-imperial and then as an anti-communist force. Um, and here, you know, once again, these are the stories of the church protecting the culture and the history, and, and under the communist era, even the physical integrity of some of the dissidents that fought um, against communist rule. And again, you know, the myth that arises is that, you know, there's this identity of Paul equals Catholic, right? It's a presumption of this widely shared identity that fuses religious and national elements. In contrast, in Italy, we don't have this kind of favorable history upon which to build these myths. In, history, in Italy, instead, what we have is a Catholic church that opposes the foundation of the Italian nation state, that opposes the unification of Italy in the 19th century, largely because the unification would have meant the loss of both wealth and privilege for the church. And so what arises in afterwards, once um, Italy becomes unified, the church issues a non expedit basically says that uh, Italians, upon the pain of excommunication, can either serve as candidates or as voters in the new Italian Republic. And as a result, what we see in Italy is a rather fierce strain of anti-clericalism. The nation remains Catholic, the nation remains religious, but it, the, those two identities never fuse. Instead, we have this anti-clericalism that's exemplified by the mangia preti, the eaters of priests, um, and the criticism of the church is often issued in very vociferous terms, whereas in Poland, um, Ireland, or in some of the other countries I talk about, even critics of the church speak with respect and deference about this powerful institution. So in these situations where you have the fusion of religious and national identities, the churches can gain enormous moral authority. If fusion is social identity, it maps onto moral authority as a political resource for churches. Now, all churches have theological authority over life, death, the rituals that surround births and weddings and so on. But some churches are also able to gain a political moral authority. They basically become seen as nonpartisan defenders of the national common good, right? So they're seen as basically um, identified with the common good and with national interest. Now, this kind of a reputation is pretty brittle. It's undercut by either partisan or immoral behavior. In Ireland, for example, what happens over the course of the 1990s are massive revelations of sex scandals, pedophilia scandals, all kinds of abuses of power that took place within the church um, and oftentimes took place against you know, the most vulnerable Irish citizens. And as a result of this immoral behavior, the church basically fails to live up to the very standards it sets out and over the course of the 1990s loses a lot of its moral authority. So how do we measure moral authority? Well, I rely on two different sets of measures. The first of these is basically a straightforward set of world value survey measures, um, apparently because you can take the girl out of Michigan, but the converse doesn't hold. Um, and so these basically is the, these are sort of measures of the average confidence of, uh, in churches um, over a 30 year period. And you'll notice the stark differences in the United States and Canada um, and Poland and Croatia. In Ireland and Italy, the differences are more muted because this average obscures the fact that in Italy, the Catholic Church goes from being something like 80, from having the confidence of over 80% of citizens to less than 50. While in Italy, once the coalition ends, confidence jumps slightly from 50 to 60%. Another measure is the historical record, right? And these are basically the record of you know, parliamentary debates, um, participant memoirs, um, the kind of record of church participation in the political life of the nation and the forms it takes. And so here what we see, and I realize that unfortunately these are, these are somewhat blurry images on the screen. But what we can see in the upper um, left-hand corner is the 1932 Irish Ecumenical Congress, which was held, it was an enormous religious celebration, held to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the, of the independent Irish state, right? And it has, you know, as, as participants, both politicians and high-ranking church officials who march hand in hand to celebrate the fantastics of, you know, survival of Ireland for 10 years as an independent country and its Catholic nature. And the two are seen as indistinguishable. Below, you have Eamon de Valera, the founder of the modern, of the, uh, of the rather, the independent Irish state, kissing the hand of Bishop John Charles McQuaid, who's a, who's, who, as we'll see, turned out to be a powerful political player in his right, in his own right. But the image is that of secular power, you know, kissing the hand of, um, of a high-ranking cleric. On turning to the right column, 
that's Lech Wałęsa, the leader of Polish Solidarity, the anti-communist trade union that arises in 8081. And he's talking to Pope John Paul II, right? And an image that legitimates both solidarity as a political force, because he's allowed to meet the Pope, for one thing, and the religious nature of solidarity, which is also you know, further shown. Um, where you actually can see, if you look at Wałęsa very closely, he's wearing a tiny little lapel pin. The lapel pin he's wearing, which, with which he was always seen, was that of the Black Madonna of Częstochowa, which is basically sort of, you know, a national shrine in Poland that celebrates Polish national survival, among other things. Um, and the joke was, and if you ever go and see the picture of the Black Madonna herself, she's wearing a tiny lapel pin of Wałęsa. Um, I've been trying to find this image. There's a great cartoon, but I haven't found it yet. And below is an open air mass during one of the Pope's visits. And notice what people are holding up, right? They're holding up flags that are marked with the symbol of solidarity and the symbol of the factories they, they work in. So it's this sort of you know, symbolic fusion of all kinds of facets of you know, both private and public citizens' lives at an open air mass that celebrates, again, Poland's survival as a nation. Now, the question is, how does this moral authority translate into influence? So if churches are seen as these defenders of the common good, how do they translate that resource, that sort of that favorable reputation, that sort of you know, favorable sort of perception into actual policy influence? Well, if the churches have high moral authority, they are, as I said earlier, seen as agents of sort of the national and common good. And that means that in times of crisis, both state and society, various sort of warring parties in, you know, within society, will turn to the church to help defuse the conflict. And this is basically empirically what happens in Ireland, this is what happens in Poland, this is what happens in Croatia, and in other countries. And the idea here basically is that churches during those moments can invest their moral authority and obtain institutional access. What they can basically do is turn to the incumbent and say, we will diffuse the situation. We will try to avoid bloodshed in the name of the nation. We will make sure that, you know, Pole doesn't speak out against Pole and Croat doesn't hurt Croat. But what we want instead is a more direct say in how the state is run to prevent bloodshed in the future. So what forms does institutional access take? What does it look like? It basically takes two forms. The first of this is an actual sharing of state sovereignty. States basically concede their sovereignty. And so we have, for example, our states conceding entire sectors of the administration um, of what states do to the churches. Um, we also have special commissions that are formed between high-ranking secular and um, church officials to basically make sure that policy comports with church preferences. And finally, we also have a widespread vetting of high-ranking officials. So basically, church officials can decide that a candidate or a nominee for a ministerial or other high-ranking position is simply unacceptable. And as a result, you know, government ministers, judges, and so on simply never get considered because the church objects. The other form that, that this institutional access takes is actually, it's more legislative. And in fact, it often consists of church bishops and church lawyers literally writing down bills and handing them over to secular authorities. It consists of writing parts of constitutions or at least actively participating in the constitutional writing process. Um, it also constitutes proposals, legislative proposals that the church basically pushes across, um, and extensive consultation. I mean, this is the second face of power, which is both hard to document and prevalent, where basically church officials prevent some bills, some policy proposals from being considered at all. Um, the Irish church especially excelled in this. So a whole swathe of proposals never made it to the floor, much less through committee, um, because the church had earlier objected. Now, the advantage of this kind of institutional access is that it's largely covert. We don't see this. We don't see the quiet back rooms. We don't see the sort of, you know, the smoke-filled consultation rooms. We simply don't see that at all, and so there's less to object to. When it is visible, as when the state run, when the church runs sectors of the government, it can be packaged as nonpartisan. If the church runs the educational sector, it's for the benefit of all citizens. Not, it's not a partisan action, which means that this doesn't cost the church much moral authority. In fact, in anything, it can help to build that moral authority. So some examples here include, in Ireland, for example, um, with the founding of the Free, Irish, uh, um, the Free Irish State, the state basically hands over the entire health, welfare, and education sectors to the church. So the church will now, the state will pay for all of these, but the church will have almost full authority over the kind of curriculum that Irish children experience, the kind of welfare provisions, and who, pro, who and when, uh, provides them and who is targeted, um, and the kind of educational um, curriculum that we see. The health will turn out to be especially important because this means that the church can basically not deliver services that it finds objectionable. 
Um, and because it has this authority, there's little the state can do. It also takes more direct forms. So John, Char uh, John Charles McQuaid, Bishop McQuaid, whose hand we saw being kissed a few slides ago, writes chunks of the Irish Constitution. He's literally there, you know, especially the articles dealing with religion, um, dealing with the family, dealing with divorce. All of those are basically written by John Charles McQuaid, and there's you know, a sort of back and forth between him and de Valera over the final form of the Constitution. In Poland, what we have is a joint commission between high-ranking representatives of the government and of the, of the church. It gets founded in 1947, during the communist era. And for those of you who like unanticipated consequences, this is a beautiful example. Because what happens is that this commission gets initially set up to monitor the church's reaction to increasing strictures on basically its, its field of action, on what it can do, on how it can proselytize, and so on. But very quickly, a series of crises rocks Polish society in 53, 56, 68, 70, 76, 80, 81. And during each one of these crises, this commission becomes the key place for party, Communist Party officials and church officials to come together and basically, um, and basically so, you know, enforce, and for the church to get its policy proposals through. And each time, the record is pretty amazing. The church refuses to release many of its, of its side of the archives, but the state parts have been released. And so the debate is pretty much always looks the same. Yes, there's unrest, there are strikes, there's something going on in this in this city. And we will help you. We definitely don't want to have any bloodshed. We definitely don't want to have societal unrest. But we also would like the following permits, the following building permits, the following you know, ability to be able to have um, uh, catechism lessons and so on. And the state concedes to one of these points. During the Polish roundtable, um, when Poland basically um, exits communism during these roundtable negotiations between the Solidarity Trade Union on the one hand and the Communist Party on the other, it's church representatives, three high-ranking bishops, who sit at the meeting. And they're there because both sides ask them to be there to sort of vouch for the proceedings. And after communism, not only does the commission, after communism ends, not only does the commission continue and become a critical place where these policy proposals are pushed through by the church, but the vetting of high-ranking officials really takes off. And this becomes sort of you know, known as, as, it became known, according to my, one of my interviewees, as you know, the telephone call from the archbishop, where you know, especially on the local level, the archbishop picks up the phone and says, this and this nominee is absolutely unacceptable to us, and that person basically doesn't even get to be considered any further to serve in their secular office. And in both of these cases, in Poland and in Ireland, the incumbents really need the church's support to survive. And so they're willing to make these kinds of concessions. They're willing to share sovereignty. In the Irish case, it was clear that without the church's support, the new Irish state would not survive. In the Polish case, both under communism and afterwards, it was clear that if the church opposed so, you know, vociferously um, these new governments, they too would fail. And so they're willing to make these concessions. Now at lower levels of moral authority, churches can still influence politics, but they have to rely on coalitions. Right? And this is sort of the new context in which to think about, about the Italian Christian democracy. Because of course these coalitions are costlier. Right? They are overt, they are partisan, and above all, given the opposition to church activity, to church partisan activity, they cost the church its, its moral authority. And this is the story of the um, Christian Democratic Church Coalition that basically lasts from 1946 to 1994. In 1994, Christian democracy collapses under its own weight um, and the party ceases to exist. But until then, this is the coalition that drives Italian politics. And as prominent as this coalition was, it was also a very uncomfortable marriage for both partners. So on the one hand, um, the Christian democracy basically develops the whole network of clientelistic institutions um, and provisions in the south of Italy to make itself more autonomous of the church. The grand history of you know, how incredibly clientelistic the Italian state is can be written in terms of the, uh, the state's uh, attempt to free itself from its dependence on the church for electoral mobilization. So on the one hand, you know, the Christian Democrats expend an enormous amount of effort to free themselves from this coalition and to develop their own clientelistic networks. On the other hand, the church itself continually complains about how unreliable this coalition is. Because even though it's dependent on its coalition, largely because both Christian Democrats and the church were very worried about the communist threat, the church really isn't able to get much from this coalition as far as its policy aims are concerned. And instead, the church becomes tainted by association. There's sort of, you know, this common image of this corrupt Christian Democratic party-oriented, dominant party, church coalition state, um, where it fuses sort of you know, clerical, political, and administrative elements to this one, so by the end, much hated behemoth. Now, what does this influence look like in practice? So once you know, 
once these channels are established, how do they actually influence the five domains that I talked about earlier? And here, I'll just talk you very briefly, talk you briefly through an example of what happens when you have high versus lower moral authority, and we'll continue with the running example of Ireland and Italy, and then look very briefly at a broader sample of Christian democracies and the kind of correlations that they show. Now, when it comes to policy influence, the Irish Catholic Church relies very heavily on its institutional access. Um, when it comes to education, it controls it from the start. Divorce is not constitutional, um, again, from the start. Abortion is illegal and then it becomes unconstitutional in 1983 at the church's behest. Um, and stem cell research, because it also involves embryos, is similarly sort of, you know, un, is basically caught in the same um, legal situation. On same-sex marriage, things are a bit different because same-sex marriage arises as a political issue in Ireland after the church loses its moral authority in the 1990s. And so there's actually going to be a referendum this year, um, and we'll see what happens. The church, of course, remains opposed, but by this point, the church has lost so much of its moral authority that it's really unable to shape the debate in ways that it, it used to be able to. This influence is also very sticky. So even though the church has lost enormous, uh, a lot of its moral authority in the 1990s, the strictures, or rather the sort of legal limbo surrounding both abortion and stem cell research remain. So there have been sort of you know, repeated tragedies, um, but because the Irish government refuses to stipulate the conditions under which abortions can be performed, um, which the Supreme Court told it to do in 1992, basically abortion remains in a legal limbo. And doctors are very afraid to perform abortions even to save a woman's life because they could be charged with murder. This is what happened in an infamous case two years ago where a woman who was having a miscarriage at 19 weeks, which is before the point of fetal viability, basically was not given an abortion and died of sepsis because the doctors treating her were too afraid of being um, charged with murder if they did give her an abortion. It's also interesting to note that you know, here, as, a, as an aside, um, the pervasiveness, so, you know, the importance of doctrine here, right? This, if you notice, in the United States, um, assisted reproduction technologies and, uh, and um, stem cell technologies are treated as two totally different policy areas. And so in the United States, for example, when it comes to assisted reproduction technologies, there's no federal guidelines at all, whereas there are very strict guidelines regarding stem cell research. And this has everything to do with the doctrinal priorities of the religious alliance that pushed for these uh, policies. Um, basically what we have are evangelicals who, both, both parties, both evangelicals and conservative Catholics, are opposed to stem cell research because that basically destroys embryos. But they're not opposed to, but the, the coalition splits over, stem, uh, over assisted reproduction, reproduction technologies. Because here, the Catholic Church also views it as the killing of embryos, whereas evangelicals view it as the sort of, you know, provision for, to be fruitful and multiply. And so, in Europe at least, everywhere, assisted reproduction technologies and stem cell research, because of the influence of the Catholic Church, are under the same regulatory regime um, across uh, European countries, because they both are seen as involving embryos. Now, to get back to the, the five policy domains that I talked about earlier, in Italy, where there's a coalition, the church basically isn't able to achieve nearly as much as it could in Ireland within these policy domains. Um, instead, what it suffers are repeated policy failures. Um, education is never under its control. The best that the Italian church can do are preschools, which it runs, um, but it's certainly never gotten the same kind of control over the edu educational center, uh, sector. It, con uh, it is unable to get its way on either divorce or abortion, which basically both of which become legalized and those, um, those Legalizations become afforded through popular referendum. And it's one big policy success is in stem cell research. And that's because there's a referendum held in 2005 um, and the church basically advocates that people not go, right? A quorum isn't reached and so stem cell research is, for, is heavily regulated in, um, in Italy in accordance with the church's preferences. But this has less to do with sort of direct church influence than it does with simply the fact that it was a beautiful Sunday and people basically wanted to stay on the beach rather than go and vote in this particular referendum. Now, to corroborate these patterns, right, these are very quickly sketched out patterns of church influence on public policy, um, I look at coalitions and access as correlates of church influence on policy. And these are very simple OLS and ordered probed regressions on a larger sample of predominantly Christian democracies. And if we can see here, um, this is the marginal effect of party coalitions on policy influence, with them basically across a range of the fusion of religious and national identities. And unfortunately, again, you can't see this very well, but the confidence interval always includes zero, right? There's some kind of a potential negative relationship, but because the uh, confidence inter interval always includes zero, we can't be sure of it. 
it basically, it's, there's no sort of, you know, there's no evidence here at all that coalitions are associated with policy influence. In contrast, if we run this a similar model on institutional access, what we see here is that there is a positive marginal effect of institutional access on policy influence. And roughly, basically, at, you know, 30% or so of people um, in a given, or poll respondents in a given country starting to claim that it's necessary to be the dominant religion in order to be the national identity, you basically see this positive effect. Now, to get back to these original puzzles, if we want to look at the differences in church influence across these policy domains, this has a lot to do with institutional access. This also explains why we see so much of this influence despite widespread popular opposition. Because the channels of this influence, when the churches are really influential, are largely covert. They're hidden from public view. And so, while society may oppose, it never finds out about much of this influence. And the how here is institutional access, rather than coalitions or popular demand. Now, I think there are three implications here, um, more broadly for political science. The first of these is that I think this calls for an unpacking of this notion of the nation state. Because in fact, nation building and state building can take on two entirely different logics. State building is largely a secular process, but nation building is not. There's, you know, it can take on the, the nation can take on a sacred value, and it can become a process that's imbued with sacredness um, under these conditions. The second implication is for quiet politics. There's been a lot, of, you know, a lot of written recently about the ways in which lobbies influence uh, policies on complicated issues, again, you know, in, sort of in the back rooms of politics. And they do so because they basically can provide an informational subsidy, um, and they can resolve these very complex, very obscure issues um, to their own favor. But what's different here is that these are hot issues. These are salient, highly politicized issues. And churches can still use quiet politics and these quiet channels um, to get their way. And finally, I think this points to the role of doctrine. Um, what doctrine really determines are you know, two decisions. It's both whether or not churches will in, uh, enter politics. Some churches, like the evangelical churches, had to be convinced for a very long time in order to enter politics. Lutheranism considers politics to be a tainted sphere that's best kept apart from religion. Whereas the Catholic Church, by dint of having basically an assumption of natural law, feels that its norms are ought, to be, ought to be universal norms and much more readily enters politics. So doctrine influences the decision to enter politics, and it also influences the kind of policy preferences that churches would like to see enacted. And with that, I welcome um, your questions. David. Great work, Anna. So one wonders whether factors which explain church influence also explain fusion. Um, so it may be factors that led to the fusion were the same factors that led to successful church influence. And how do you sort out uh, uh, the independent effect of fusion when it may in fact be caused by, <coughs> caused by the same thing that causes uh, institutional success? Right. So I think here is where, you know, I, the, the way to sort of get around this problem is to look at the sequencing, right? Because fusion occurs before the church's attempt to influence politics, at least through these channels. So this is, you know, this is one main claim why you know, the fusion predates a lot of these states and the way in which they, they, they take form. It actually doesn't have much to do with how, you know, what these states look like. In the post and creation case, if anything, whatever the church wanted, they wouldn't get as far as the, you know, the way that the state, the state is shaped. So the fusion takes place first. And it's only then when, you know, in effect, a largely exogenous state is imposed do the churches begin to start to exercise this institutional influence. It still could be that some factor that, that led to, um, to the fusion was there uh, after the fusion uh, to create uh, the, the high levels of church influence. So it may be some societal effect that created them both, no? No, absolutely. I mean, so, so that's definitely a possibility. And this is not, I have not eliminated all, all the potential other causes. Um, in the, the book project, I do run an instrumental variable, um, it, you know, this classic two-stage least squares equation, to account for that possibility. Um, and it's, you know, depending on the specification, it's either a strong or an ambiguous effect. But you're absolutely right. You know, this is not, this is not you know, it's sort of a cleanly identified cause. And in fact, what I would argue is that you know, there are multiple channels by which churches influ influence politics. And it may be that there's, you know, the, the question is, you know, what would the prior factor look like, right? 
And here, you know, at least uh, using theory, I basically try to attempt all these other potential causal factors through the, through the selection of the cases. So it's not a question of simply a Catholic monopoly. It's not just, you know, religiosity. It's not just democratic status. Um, it's not sort of, you know, patterns of ethnic, uh, ethnic homogeneity. And so, you know, barring some strong theory about what these prior factors would look like, um, you know, I think I've attempted to at least, making the usual concessions, to at least identify in one strong cause of church influence. Hi, Anna. Um, thank you for your talk. It was great. I'm even happier that I already bought a book then. Uh, but um, I have two questions. I just wanted you to tell, you, tell us a little bit more of your concept of influence, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm curious about two things, Anna. The first one is, uh, how, does it, how does it matter um, in the scale of priorities of the church and church leaders, right? So how, if, if they start losing influence, uh, what would they give up in order to keep their influence? And how, how important it is to have influence over having other things that they could care also um, when they are uh, a church. And the second thing is, how much does it matter to different actors within a religion, a religion in a given country, right? So I would guess that probably um, high level rank, high, high rank um, members of the church would care a lot about influence when they, we are talking about writing laws and uh, influencing policy, but would probably matter less for priests, would probably matter less for people in the ground. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about this notion of influence that you mm -hmm. have worked in. Mm -hmm. Um, well, when it comes to the first question, you know, how important is it for churches to have policy influence, right? That varies both by doctrine and by nation. And so in some countries, you know, the same Catholic church as in Canada, for example, largely steps out of politics and says that's just not our sphere after basically the quiet revolution in Quebec. Um, in others, as in Poland, the church is incredibly active in politics and, you know, wants these policy preferences to be pushed through time and time again. So some of this is national. Some of this is doctrinal. As I mentioned before, you know, some churches simply have a much higher threshold for entering politics or wanting to influence polit uh, policy, whereas others, by dint of doctrinal commitments, have a much lower one. Um, and when it comes to, you know, to the differentiation among the different levels of the church, so this mostly focuses on national level politics, and it is very much the hierarchy that matters here, right? This are the top echelons. But I completely concede the fact that on the lower levels, you know, most priests are much more worried about the fact that, you know, their church, leaf, uh, ch church roof is leaking and, you know, there's competition from the Pentecostals and, you know, what am I going to do to basically keep my flock going, right? Then they care about the dictates of doctrine and the kind of policy preferences that it imposes. It's on? Hi. Um, thank you for the lovely talk. Thank you. It was very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm interested whether it also applies um, outside of the Christian realm. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to think about Israeli and Indian uh, politics and coalition politics and whether, um, whether they've been involved, whether they've been within the government and organizing as political parties as religious um, political parties has been very, very significant for their ability to push forward religious agenda. And so I'm trying to think um, in these cases, whether is it because there's no uh, religious part, like you talked about coalitions, but running officially as a, as a, um, as a political party, or w why do you think there could be, I'm trying to think because it really, is it unique for a Christian story, or what could be the underlying process there? Thank you. So I, I don't think this set of mechanisms is, is necessarily unique to the, to the Christian story. Um, the, it's just that there are so many, once you move beyond the Christian world, there are so many other confounders that I wanted to keep this as you know, tightly knit as possible, precisely for the reasons that David identifies. That, you know, it's already hard to keep this whole causal story from, from um, falling apart under the weight of po potential confounders. But I think when it comes to, um, Israeli politics, for example, there's a different story, right? There, these are parties that represent specific religious communities, you know, the super orthodox, et cetera, et cetera. They don't make a claim to represent the nation. In fact, you know, the nation doesn't, you know, particularly, they, in fact, if anything, they claim not to represent the nation, but these specific communities. And as such, they're a very different set of political uh, actors, right? They don't pay the price for, you know, entering politics because the only constituency that they care about are the ones, uh, is the one that they represent. 
So the parties that pay this kind of price for entering into coalitions or influencing politics are ones that try to make the claim that they have a national moral authority, right? That they somehow are, by dint of history or by dint of, um, of their previous actions, representatives of the common good. And the religious parties in Israel, for example, don't make that claim at all. They just represent a narrow constitu constituency, and they don't care about how other sectors of Israeli society react, um, because that's not where their constituency is, that's not where they derive their power. So it's a different dynamic. Um, one more question. Hi, very interesting. This extends beyond what you're talking about because you're <clears throat> talking more about religious power um, on a national or larger level. But I'm curious to what extent you've studied the effect of the equivalent of a First Amendment, the characteristics where in some countries, the United States specifically, there's both protected constitutionally freedom of expression and prohibition of establishment of religion and how that plays into it. And just a, a second question, which I'd be interested in your comments on. There's been a controversy in the neighboring state here in Indiana about the use of religious freedom and to what extent that and anti-discrimination are involved and did that issue arise in, in your research? Right. Um, so regarding the first question, the First Amendment basically sets a very low threshold for religious groups to become politically active. But what it also imposes on them is this extra onus of not being able to call themselves political organizations, right? And so churches have to thread a very fine needle, especially mostly thanks to the changes in the tax code, um, in order to basically be, on the one hand, able to speak out about politics, and on the other hand, not be charged with being a political organization. But what the First Amendment does fundamentally is to, it, it does two things. It lowers the threshold for political action, and it also generates an enormous amount of religious competition. So, and that's been used as an explanation for why the United States is so religious, um, much more religious than other countries of its level of development, um, partly because there's this enormous religious competition. What there also is, um, and this is something I argue in the book, is this sort of, from very early on, a sort of a myth of America as a Christian nation. Um, it then becomes a Judeo-Christian nation for a very long time. They, again, this is a particular form of the fusion of national and um, religious identities. It's much more vague because there's no monopoly. It's diffused among different churches. But there still is a very strong norm of a Christian nation that persists for a very long time. And that, in turn, further sort of, you know, allows the churches to speak out about politics, right? Because they're seen as you know, trusted moral agents in some sense, at least by narrower groups. But the story in the United States, because it's not a religious monopoly, um, is much more diffused, and it's the moral authority is diffused among many more churches. Um, but to get back to the First Amendment, it basically allows all these churches to compete with each other and to articulate their visions um, with sort of, you know, minimum effort. Right, but it, it has the other aspect too, the anti-establishment aspect that right. limits what they can do. Right, and so, you know, in the other countries I look at, it's not as if... The, what the anti-establishment does, basically, what the anti-establishment clause does, is that it basically precludes certain forms of direct state influence, right? So they can't, you know, so churches in these other countries, including Canada, are able to inveigle themselves into the state in ways that churches have a much harder time doing in the United States because of the anti-establishment clause. But what they do instead is basically take over the Republican Party, right? And so there's a fantastic story of what happens basically in the late 70s when conservative evangelicals and the Republican Party form this coalition. They bring on board um, conservative Catholics in the 90s and what results is in effect you know, institutional access within one of the two main political parties. Where now you know, conservative Christians basically nominate the candidates, they write the platforms, they serve as the vast majority of the delegates um, and they basically sort of, you know, if they can't take over the state, qua the state, they take over um, the Republican Party instead. We thank our speaker. Thank you very much.